All right. Uh, can can everyone see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen and we can hear you. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to speak here. I mean, it's my first talk in an online seminar, so I hope I handled the technology fine. So what I'm going to talk about is um, topological periodic homology as a non-commutative crystalline cohomology. And I mean, basically, I'm going to explain this headline for the next hour. So what, what do I mean by um, non-commutative geometry? Basically, I mean I, the non-commutative geometry that was developed and like explored by Konsevich and collaborators. And in a sense, the starting observation is that uh, many notions, invariants, and properties of schemes, of schemes, schemes X, only depend on the derived category only depend on, on the derived category of perfect complexes over X. And I'm gonna treat this derived category here as a DG category or as a stable infinity category. And so the idea is to say in general, these kind of guys are non-commutative schemes and we're gonna develop a geometry for those. Um, so I'm gonna start by a little table, like which can serve as a little bit of an overview of what I'm doing. And hopefully I can sort of explain the terms in this table in the next 50 minutes. Okay, so here's my commutative side on the left. And on the right, I have my non-commutative side. So, I mean, what is, what is the object of study in commutative geometry? Well, it's schemes and say schemes X over a spec K where K is some ground ring and a commutative ring, maybe a field. And so what, what are we going to replace that by? We're just going to replace it by a DG category, C over K. So I hope everyone knows what a DG category is. DG category is just a category enriched over the category of chain complexes of K modules. Okay, and now, um, well, okay, that's, that's the idea. So I'm just going to consider DG categories as um, non-commutative schemes. And then there are a bunch of notions of schemes and what do they correspond to? For example, the product of schemes, X cross over spec K with Y, this will just correspond to the tensor product of DG categories. So if I have two DG categories C and D, I can form a tensor product. The objects are just gonna be the product of objects and the homes are just gonna be the tensor product of homes. And uh, another thing is if you have a, if you, and, and implicitly, of course, I'm claiming that in the case that, I mean, you are in the commutative situation, the right-hand column will generalize the left-hand one. So for example, there's a notion of a scheme being proper. And the scheme being proper corresponds to a DG category being proper, which means for all pairs of objects, X, Y, and C, the hum, X, Y, which is now going to be an object in the derived category of K is perfect. Okay, so that's what properness is. And um, there are similar notions. I mean, there's a notion of when a scheme is smooth, of course, and there's also a notion of when a DG category is smooth. So scheme being smooth corresponds to the DG category C being smooth, i.e., what does this mean? This means C is perfect over C op tensor K C. So if C is, for example, a DG algebra, then it's clear why I, I, A is a bimodule over C. And for DG category, this just means C as a bimodule. So C op tensor K C is basically the home functor of C. It's an object functor from C op tensor K C to chain complex, and this is perfect. Okay, that's what it means to be smooth. And um, finally, the most important notions for us are gonna be the following. So on a scheme, you have the drum complex and basically actually I'm running out of space now. Probably have to go to the next page, make a new table. Oh, sorry, so let me just make a new table. So, okay, so there's the notion of the drum complex of a, of a, of a scheme, so the drum complex. Omega star x over k, so algebraic differential forms, just the usual Durham complex we know from, uh, from, from differential geometry and interpret it algebraically, basically. And this corresponds to the Hochschild homology 
C or a K, the Hochschild homology groups. So this is like the first thing I'm probably going to recall in a second homology. Okay. And um, the next thing is when you have the Durham complex, you can also form Durham cohomology. And so what is Durham cohomology? Homology, and this is going to be like a little bit of an overview. I'm going to say things more concrete. And really what we're going to consider is two periodic Durham cohomology. You can just make the RAM cohomology two periodic. And then this is just going to be what is called periodic homology. Homology HP star C relative to K. And finally, the thing I will mostly be talking about is like, I mean, there's a thing called crystalline cohomology. Crystalline cohomology. And maybe, uh, if you want, you can assume we're working over FP here or over some perfect ring of characteristic P. And really, again, we're gonna look at some two periodic version, periodic. And this is corresponding to topological periodic homology. Periodic homology. DP star C, and I'm gonna make, I mean, a relative version of that today. Okay, and um, I'm not assuming that everyone knows what crystalline cohomology is. So the beauty of this theory of topological periodic homology is that it in particular sets up like totally new approach to crystalline cohomology which, uh, without knowing of what Grotendieck has done and without knowing of the crystalline side and all of that. Okay, so this is the overview of what I'm going, going to do today. All right, so if there are no questions about that or are there questions about that this far? Then I'm going to... Yeah. Thomas, I have a quick question. I don't know if I missed this or so, but you, know, you talked about how the non-commutative side generalizes the commutative side, of course, right? So that means a scheme X is supposed to correspond to some DG category. So what am I supposed to think of? The, the perfect DG, I mean, the category, the category of perfect chain complexes of uh, quasi-coherent modules. Okay. Quasi-coherent sheaves. Yeah, okay, thanks. Right, and so, yes. And, and so in particular, I'm claiming that, for example, the scheme is gonna be proper if and only if the DG category is proper. And the RAM complex is literally the Hochschild homology of that category, and so on and so forth. And I'm gonna substantiate that now because I'm not assuming everyone knows everything about Hochschild homology. I'm gonna recall these notions quickly. Okay, so let me do that. So, um, definition. So if C is, a DG category over K. And by the way, really, I mean, the reader who is more happy with stable infinity categories, you can also think of an HK linear stable infinity category. But let me stick to DG categories for, the, for this talk because it's more concrete. So if C is a DG category over K, let's recall what Hochschild homology is. So Hochschild homology of C relative to K I mean, this is going to be a chain complex, so an object in the derived category of K. And I mean, the usual Hochschild homology groups are going to be the homology groups of this chain complex. And how does it look like? Well, we do the cyclic bar construction. What's the cyclic bar construction? Well, in the lowest degree, it's going to be the direct sum over all objects X in our category C. And then we take HOM X comma X. So that's the direct sum of chain complexes. And then in the next degree, it's going to be the direct sum, or maybe Gonna say flipping this. Um, it's going to be the direct sum of all pairs of objects x, y, objects in C, and then we take HOM x, y and tensor, this is the chain complex, and tensor it with HOM y, x over k. Right? I mean, sorry, I hope this is somewhat readable. Uh, my handwriting is terrible on this pad. I apologize for that. And there are two ways, two maps from the direct sum over pairs of morphisms to morphisms by just composing in, in two different orders. These land in two different components of the right-hand sum, right? The one corresponding to X and the one corresponding to Y. And then it's clear I can just go on, like I sort of can take sums of three tensor products, three objects X, Y, Z, and, and, and triple tensor product and so on. And uh, that's gonna be a simplicial object. And then I can take the, realization of that, which in this world of chain complexes is just a total complex of this uh, associated double complex. Okay, that's what the Hochschild homology of a DG category is.
All right. Um, I hope everyone is happy with that. And really, I mean, one note, um, one might wonder if one have to, has to derive this tender product over K and the answer is yes. And I'm implicitly assuming everything has been derived here. I'm not going to write derived tender product. So whenever you see a tender product, it's going to be derived. Okay, good. So what's an example? So the classical example of Hochschild homology is the following. If R is just any K algebra, and I'm going to say it's a smooth K algebra. So for example, think of a polynomial ring. In particular, it's commutative. Then we can form Hochschild homology. And what is that now? I mean, there are basically two ways of assigning a DG category to a, to a K algebra. I can either consider the DG category, which has a single object and R as endomorphisms of this object, or I can take the DG category, which is just perfect complexes over my R. And it turns out that Hochschild homology is equivalent for the two choices. So our, our choice will always be to sort of take the DG category, which is perfect complexes. And then we take Hochschild homology of that. But again, this is equi equivalent to the other one, which has a much smaller uh, cyclic bar construction, of course. And this theorem is like Hochschild constant Rosenberg, HKR, state that this is isomorphic to the Durham complex R over K, the Durham complex. So the nth Hochschild homology group is isomorphic to the nth layer in the Durham complex, not the Durham cohomology. Okay, that's a classical HKR theorem. And that is why in my, my table at the beginning, I had like Hochschild homology being the non-commutative version of the Durham complex. Okay, and that, I mean, as I said, like this is true for smooth algebras. And if you want to say, say something for non-smooth algebras, you can put like so-called derived Durham cohomology on the right, like studied by Bagaf, Bat and others. Okay, so that is the case of smooth algebras. And now there's a sort of funny, funny thing in this formula, right? Because, I mean, the right-hand side is a, is a complex, really. The Durham complex has a differential, but the left-hand side is just homology groups of something. So why would there be another differential on the homology groups of a chain complex? And uh, that is what, what Conhop has observed always exists. So he says that this chain complex, Hochschild homology, C over K, and I'm going to express this in modern language. This has an S S1 action. And I mean, what does S1 action mean? So if S1, S1 is a homotopy type. And S1 as a homotopy type can act on, the, any, on any object in a DG category or an infinity category. So, but I mean, more concretely, an S1 action on a chain complex is just equivalent to saying it's, it has a DG module structure over chains on S1, which, which is actually isomorphic to the homology of S1 as well as in K by a formality result, which is just K epsilon mod epsilon squared. In other words, like an S1 action is just equivalent to giving an additional differential corresponding to epsilon. So the Hochschild complex has somehow two differentials, one being the chain complex differential and one being the S1 action. And the S1 action differential, so the so-called con operator, this corresponds to the Ram differential under the HKR isomorphism of my last example. Okay, so I assume all of you have basically heard the story probably. I think Ak Akhil has given an overview, uh, like a, sort of lecture series in this seminar. So probably, but if not, feel free to ask. This is kind of confusing if you hear that for the first time. But if you've already heard it, it's probably clear. Okay, and but I want to say it in this homotopy theoretic sense that I have an S1 action. And again, S1 is considered as a homotopy type. It's not that we can act by an angle of, you know, 37 degrees. It's just a homotopy theoretic statement. Okay, so. What now? So now we have this S1 action. We can make the following definition. Uh, we can define the next term in our, in our uh, table, namely periodic homology or cyclic periodic homology, R relative to K. And this is just now given by the Hochschild homology of R relative K. 
this has an S1 action, and then we can take the so-called Tate S1 construction. That's in this case basically a localization of the homotopy, I mean homotopy fixed points. Right? If we could also take the homotopy fixed point, that would be called negative cyclic homology in the language of con. And then we can form this Tate S1. So let me just say this is Tate S1, Tate S1 construction. And in this algebraic setting, this is always too periodic. It's a statement about Tate cohomology. And I don't really want to go super deeply into what exactly Tate cohomology is. Let me just say this is somehow an operation like taking homotopy fixed points. And in algebraic land, it's always too periodic. And if I apply that to a spectrum with a single homotopy group, it reduces to classical Tate cohomology, which some of you might have heard. And I don't know, unless someone wants me to say more about Tate cohomology, I just want to go with this definition. And I mean, this is not necessarily the easiest way to say that um, if you're just interested in the algebra, but it's a way which most easily uh, generalized to topology in a second. That's why I'm saying it the way I do. Okay, good. So um, that is what periodic homology is. And let's, let's run an example as well. Example. And this is if again, R over K is smooth. And I mean, I'm just working with rings. The following statement becomes somewhat wrong if I say it for schemes. So let me just say for rings. It's saying that the periodic homology of R relative to K. This is isomorphic to now the Ram cohomology of spec R relative k, but then made two periodic. So t plus minus, where t is a generator in degree minus two. Right, so before we had this algebraic Duram complex, so we can just take the cohomology of that algebraic Duram complex, that's what algebraic Duram cohomology is. And then we're just gonna add a generator in, I mean, an invertible generator in degree two, a Laurent, Laurent generator. And yeah, that's what, what it looks like. So this is the sense in which, I mean, periodic homology is to be considered as a generalization of the Ram cohomology. And in fact, I think this is why Kohn actually considered it initially, because he was, I mean, in his setup of non-commuted geometry with these star algebras, he was looking for what, what the Duram cohomology would be in that non-commutative setup. And then he couldn't quite, I mean, so basically I'm saying we can't quite say what Duram cohomology is, but we can say what two periodic Duram cohomology is. And that's quite as good, uh, equally good. Okay, so that's what, what the Duram cohomology of a non-commutative scheme is. HP of the DG category C, which is a non-commutative scheme. Okay, good. So that's my, uh, General recap of Hochschild homology and periodic homology. So this would be the point to ask a question if you if you have questions about this. Okay, now I have to open a new page. Okay, good. So now I'm gonna turn my attention to the case that K is FP. Or in fact, everything I'm going to say now will work for over any perfect commutative ring of characteristic P. So what is the problem? I mean, like what, I mean, I'm, I'm going to go towards crystalline cohomology. So let me just describe a little bit what was the initial motivation of crystalline cohomology, at least as far as I understand it. So, I mean, so far we've talked about the Ram cohomology. Now, if we have any scheme or any ring over FP, we can just take it to Ram cohomology. And that's a well-known invariant, you can take this. But what Groten, Grotendieck was af after and other people like Weil, they wanted to use some, some cohomology theory in order to count points on schemes over FP, right? I, wanted, I wanna count points, like how many points does this scheme have? And well, if you have a cohomology theory, which is characteristic P, then you can never count points, you can only count points mod P. So they were after proving the Y conjectures by some left, left shed style trace formula, but so you can't really use a cohomology theory as well as an FP vector space to lift that. So in other words, the problem of, of the Ram cohomology that it's characteristic P. And so what, what Grotendieck wanted to do is he wants to find a lift of the Ram cohomology or some cohomology theory which takes values in over the integers. 
So we want a list of, and I mean, in this non-commutative language, it's, it reads like a list of the periodic homology C over FP to ZP, the p addicts. In other words, I want, a, I want a homology theory which takes values in the p addicts. So instead of chain complexes over FP, I have chain complexes over ZP sub, such that upon mod P reduction, it gives me back periodic homology. Right, that's what I mean by lift. So take, I want a cohomology theory with wells and ZP modules and it gives back like periodic homology. And as far as I know, this was not constructed purely algebraically such a cohomology theory in this non-commutative setup. And I think what, I mean, yeah. So Konsevich and Zoebelmann had, had some conjectures about the existence of such a lift. But I mean, I'll come to this in a second to the fact that TP is such a lift, topological periodic homology. I will present a precise theorem along these lines. But let me first explain like what Grotendieks and what, what might be your first attempt in order to find such a lift. So what, what, you can, what you can hope is like you, I mean, you have this kind of DG category over FP. And you can assume that there exists a lift C bar, a DG category, category over ZP. Well, which lifts C such that, I mean, for C bar, if I base change it over ZP to FP, in other words, I reduce mod P, and again, all tensor products are derived, then this is equivalent to our initial C. It's what, what, what is called the lift of our DG category C. For example, if you have a scheme or like a ring over FP, this would literally just be a lift. And for example, if you have smooth rings, like polynomial rings, they obviously do admit lifts. The polynomial ring over FP obviously admits the lift over ZP. And so if we have such a lift, then it turns out that periodic homology of this lifted guy relative to ZP, we take this modulo P. I mean, that's just a, another way of writing, take HP, Z bar relative ZP and base change it over ZP with FP. Then the point is that, I mean, in the definition of Hochschild homology, I have, I mean, there's a bunch of tensor products, right? And a co-limit. And all these tensor products and co-limits will just commute with taking this base change to FP. And so if I take Hochschild homology of C bar and base change it, it will recover Hochschild homology of the base changed category over, F, over, CP, over FP. And it turns out with a little extra argument, one can show that this is also true for periodic homology. So this is equivalent to periodic homology of the base changed guy C relative to FP. So in other words, if I make the somewhat brutal assumption that my scheme or my non-commutative scheme, my DG category admits a lift over ZP, I get such a lifted cohomology theory. Okay, and this is basically what, what I mean, Groton T took as a starting point, but I mean, there are some obvious problems now if you want to use that as a definition of such a cohomology theory. One problem is, well, not every scheme does it, or every non-commutative scheme does admit a lift over ZP. The other problem is even if it does admit the lift, how much does this kind of periodic homology of the lifted guy depend on the lift, right? And so basically Grotendieck's idea was to say, let's just set up a site which somehow locally takes care of all the choices of lifts. And this way we're gonna define the site theoretic cohomology theory. That's what, what is crystalline cohomology. And eventually he proved that after P completion, it's equivalent to periodic homology of a lifted guy or the Ram cohomology of lifted guy. So that's one way of proving that this kind of uh, Ram cohomology or periodic homology of a lifted guy is invariant of the choices made. Okay, that's, that's Grotendieck's approach. So Grotendieck basically took this kind of attempt that I sketched here as a definition and observed locally everything admits lifts. And then with this kind of ingenious site he sets up, he sort of takes care control, I mean, takes control of all the choices made. And we are going to take a totally different approach. And we're just going to define something, namely topological Hochschild homology and topological periodic homology, and just observe that this also implements our idea. We're not sort of inputting this idea, but it's just an a posteriori effect. I think it's, it's very nice that this comes out like the way it does. 
Okay, so let me let me explain that. So here's the definition. So what is topological Hochschild homology? Well, I mean, let's say C is still as before DG category over FP. And so what I want to do, I want to just take Hochschild homology not with respect to the basis FP, but with respect to deeper basis, namely the sphere. So what this precisely means is if I have a DG category over FP, I can consider it as a spectrally enriched category, right? Like um, chain complexes over FP are the same as module spectra over HFP. So I'm just going to forget this module structure so that I'm enriched over spectra. And then for a spectrally enriched category, I can basically write down the same definition as, as Hochschild homology as above, the cyclic bar construction. And that's what topological Hochschild homology is. So from this perspective, it's just taking Hochschild homology with respect to deeper bases. And then to topological periodic homology is just going to be, well, periodic homology with respect to deeper bases. Or in other words, I take THHC and take Tate S1. So you still have to observe that there's an S1 action. Okay, so that's a sort of a little bit cheaty, but kind of very instructive definition of, of THH and TP. And uh, the real cool thing or the amazing thing is that this turns out to be a really good idea. Even if we're just interested in algebra, it's super useful to go down to the sphere. For example, THH of FP. That's what Bergstedt has calculated. That is a polynomial ring on a generator in degree 2x. And uh, I'm not going to write that, but let me just mention that, of course, if you work relative to this deeper base, the first deeper base, then FP that occurs is the integers. And if you did the same maneuver, namely work relative to the integers, Hochschild homology of FP relative to the integers is, is less, much less nice. It's a divided power, a divided polynomial ring, and not a polynomial ring. And what is TP star of FP? Well, that ends up being um, the P addicts adjoined uh, Laurent series generator, T plus minus, where T is in degree minus two. That's topological periodic homology of FP. And in fact, we can say a little bit more. It's something I proved with Peter Scholze, but which I think is also was known to some people that TP of FP, I mean, I gave you the homotopy groups, right? The homotopy groups are log raw series ring, but I can give you, in fact, the description of the spectrum as an E infinity ring spectrum. It's given by the Eilenberg McLean spectrum on the P addicts. And then you take Tate S1 with respect to the trivial S1 action. And as such, it's equivalent. In particular, there's a, it's, it's going to be ZP linear, right? If you, if you look at THHFP, this is going to be something over FP. And now TP is going to be Tate S1. And so if you, if you, if you think about it, that's a Tate spectral sequence, it, I mean, which somehow has to do with Tate cohomology. And this is immediately going to degenerate at E2 because everything is even. But then there's a non-trivial extension problem coming up in this Tate spectral sequence because the E infinity page of this Tate spectral sequence is just going to be FPX, T plus minus. And the fact that TP is just the P addicts adjoined a single Laurent series gener uh, polynomial generator, this is like a non trivial extension problem showing up in the spectral sequence. And that is what's really nice about topological periodic homology that you have this non trivial extension problem. You get something over the integers. Right? And that is reflected in the fact that TP as a spectrum is this kind of Eilenberg McLean spectrum to the Tate S1. So, in particular, it's going to be HCP linear. That's a highly non-trivial statement. A priori, it's only guaranteed to be S-linear over the sphere. OK. And well, you can also express THHFP if you want as an E infinity ring. Then the formula is it's a connective cover of HZ Tate CP, the T CP Tate construction. OK. So that is something maybe a lot of people have heard me say before or like other people say that before. So let me give you something new now. Here's a new theorem, which 
clarifies the relation of topological periodic homology to crystalline homology. So if C is a DG category over FP, then the first statement is, well, I mean, this follows, the first part follows from what I said before, TPZ is ZP linear, meaning it's canonically a HZP module spectrum. I mean, this of course now follows because T TP of C is gonna be a module over TP of FP. All the constructions involved are compatible with ring structures. And I mean, TP FP, as we've seen before, is, an, is a CP linear. So that follows, but more importantly, and I have a statement that TPC reduced mod P. Well, that is, I mean, because I'm CP linear, a better way of writing that is base change over ZP with FP. The statement is that this is equivalent to periodic homology of C relative to FP. Okay. So, and I mean, this statement is not new. This was like observed by several people. I think it was used by Bud Morrow Scholz. I've done that a couple of years ago in a paper with Akil and Ben, Akil Matthew and Ben Antio. But the second part is new. The second part is basically, I mean, this is somehow one of the defining properties of crystalline cohomology that it reduces to the RAM cohomology or periodic cohomology in this non-commutative setup. And the other one is that if there exists a lift C bar of C, and by lift, I mean again, lift over the p-adics, then we have an equivalence, namely TP of, of C. So that's an invariant which is just depends on C, right? It's just working relative to the sphere. That is p-adically equivalent to periodic homology of that lifted guy. Okay, and that is basically in particular proving that the periodic homology of that lifted guy does not depend on the choice of lift, right? And it's a totally different proof than the one that Grotendieck has given in the commutative setup of this fact. I mean, by just observe, I mean, defining TP in a somewhat direct way. Okay, and that's, uh, I guess this theorem, like Peter Scholze has communicated to me a proof of this theorem um, if C is smooth and proper, but I mean, in this generality, it's new. Okay, so that's, that's my first uh, sort of, justification for considering TP as non-commutative crystalline cohomology and maybe the better one, and this is not only due to me, but to many people is for X smooth, and I'm gonna comment in a second who did what. For X smooth over smooth scheme over FP, there exists is a spectral sequence, conditional convergent spectral sequence from I guess under this assumption, yeah, it's conditionally convergent. I was gonna say it's convergent, but it's not because the dimension might be unbounded. From two periodic crystalline cohomology, lean cohomology to TPX, TP star X. Right, the E2 page is gonna be two periodic crystalline cohomology but there might be some differentials coming up. So as before I said, TP was a version of two periodic crystalline cohomology. I mean, this is like only true up to the fact that there might be differentials in the spectral sequence, but in a lot of cases it will just degenerate at a two in fact. For example, rationally it always degenerates. And in fact, I mean, the way I state three is really not good because in reality there are three different spectral sequences. There's one which is due to Lars Hesselholt in the original paper about TP. Then there's one which is due to Bud Moro Scholze. And there's one which is due to Ben Antio and me. And these three spectral sequences are all related. So ours is in, say, in, in a sense a Hodge to Ram type spectral sequence. The BMS one is a, is a conjugate spectral sequence of that. So the one of Bud Moro Scholze is in, in a sense knows much more, but it's kind of way harder to construct. Okay, but, and in fact, uh, these spectral sequences are pretty useful to compute that in, in, in cases, like for K3 surfaces or, or similar stuff. Okay, so 
that is uh, one theorem. And so the upshot, in my opinion, of this theorem and like some, some other work is that TP behaves to crystalline cohomology. Cohomology the same way that HP behaves to Durham cohomology. It's literally like the non-commutative variant of the two periodic version of that. And um, one thing I initially was planning to mention, I think I'm basically already running short on time is um, that crystalline cohomology has a lot of good properties. It's not just any cohomology theory, but it's, it's what's called a vial cohomology theory. So for example, that means if, if I'm applying it to smooth and proper schemes, it has some really good finiteness properties. And if I'm applying it to products of schemes, then I have a QNET isomorphism, or at least a QNET spectral sequence, like a, a splitting on the level of chain complexes. And you could ask, uh, does TP have similar properties? I mean, in the, in the commutative case, it basically follows from the commutative results, but in the non-commutative case, I mean, we initially said there was a notion of smooth and proper schemes. You can, you can wonder if it's still true that TP of such a smooth and proper scheme has some nice finiteness properties. And that's something which was proven by Plumberg and Mandel. They proved that if, if C is smooth and proper over, over FP, then TP of C is gonna be perfect over TP of FP. I mean, recall TP of FP was just two periodic. So in other words, we just have two finitely generated abelian groups, TP0 and TP1. TP2 is already isomorphic to TP0. And that's, I mean, that's something concrete, right? You have an actual finitely generated abelian group. It's a good invariant. I mean, something you can measure the rank of, for example, of the torsion. And what they also prove is that if you have a product of non-commutative schemes, in other words, the tensor product of DG category, then you have a QNET isomorphism. Then TP of the product is going to be TPC and tensor over TPFP with TPD. And finally, there's another piece of structure which I'm, for time reasons, might mention in the end, but not now, is that there's also a version of the so-called non -com I mean, the Cartier isomorphism. There's a non-commutative Cartier isomorphism, which I proved in work with Antio, Matthew, which then led to a new proof of the hodge deram degeneration, which was a conjecture of Konsevich and initially proven by Kaledi. Okay, but I mean, I might do that in the end if I have time left. So for the moment, you just, uh, we just take away that TP is a good version of crystalline cohomology over FP. And basically everything I said is true over every perfect ring of characteristic P. And now the question is what, what happens over other bases? Now, now we're gonna drop the assumption that T is, uh, K is FP. So K is gonna be an arbitrary commutative base ring. And what is the problem? Why can't we just do the same story? Why is not uh, TP just still a good cohomology theory? And the problem is that THHK, as well as TPK, TP star K, I mean, these are defined, these are complicated. <laughs> For example, if you do THH of the integers of Z, this is just gonna be, well, it's gonna be Z mod N in degree star, which is two N plus one. So it's Z mod two in degree three, Z mod three in degree five and so on. So in particular, all cup products are zero. It's, I mean, it's a terrible ring. It's just a big square zero extension as a ring. Of course, it's a Z in degree zero, the, the even degrees are zero. And so all THHs of like any DG category over the integers is gonna be a module over that and be, be equally uh, badly behaved. And uh, now, now here's, a, here's a way around that to solve that problem in a sense, to replace that by something better. And that's uh, the following theorem, which is a consequence of my work with Ben Antio. And it says the following, um, there is a map, a map of spectra 
And really it's a map of E infinity spectra in cyclotomic spectra, E infinity objects in cyclotomic spectra from THHK to something we call tau less or equal zero cyclotomic of THHK. And really, I mean, really there's some sort of T structure sitting in the background, which I don't want to mention today, but this is like a truncation in a T structure. But let me just say what properties this tau less or equal zero cyclotomic of THHK has. The homotopy groups of this tau less or equal zero cyclotomic of THHK, these are given as follows. They are given by the associated graded of a filtration coming from an ideal. So IN mod IN plus one for star even to N and zero else. So they're completely even where, what is, what is I? I is an ideal in the ring of bit vectors of K. So recall that K was any commutative base ring. So we take the ring of bit vectors of K and it's the augmentation ideal, augmentation ideal. So, so in other words, I mean, WK mod I is just gonna be K. Right, there's a map from the width vectors of every ring back to the ring, and it's the kernel of that map. And of course, like, I mean, by my formula, I see this is the same as pi naught of this guy, glutomic THHK. And, um, right, so Bergstedt's theorem can be read as saying that the map from THHK to tau less or equals zero cyclotomic THHK for K equals FP is an, is an equivalence. So that's, I mean, in fact, a consequence of how, how the augmentation ideal in the bit vectors over FP behaves is that, I mean, in this case, the map is an isomorphism, an equivalence of spectra. But in general, it's not. Just for example, for the integers, it's not. And now I'm gonna take advantage of this better, better behaved object. So <coughs> what I would like to have is like, I want, want to have an invariant like THH and TP, but which is not linear over THHK, but which is linear over this better guy. It's tau less or equal zero cyclotomic of THHK. And well, I can just do that by base changing. So I'm gonna define a variant which I call relative THH and relative, I put a little cyclotomic because there's another relative, a stupid relative, which is just Hochschild homology. But here I'm gonna do this cyclotomic relative and this is just defined to be take THHC. That's a module, so I mean, I should have maybe said that C is a DG category. Category over K, oh, sorry, o over K, over K. And then uh, THHC is gonna be a module over THHK. So I can base change over THHK to this new guy, tau less or equal zero cyclotomic THHK. Okay, so that's my proposed like good relative THH. And I mean, for the experts, this is gonna be also a cyclotomic spectrum, for example, as opposed to relative THH, ordinary relative THH. And then I'm gonna define the topological periodic homology relative to K just to be, well, I mean, the same as before. I just take this, this guy, THH, C relative K and take T as one. Okay, so, <coughs> and now, I mean, for example, I mean, if I do that for K itself, it's gonna be, I mean, this, I mean, for example, I mean, uh, let me maybe write this example, TP of K relative cyclotomic to K. This is just gonna be, the homotopy groups are just gonna be two periodic over the width vectors, T plus minus. That's a little theorem. And so here's, here's the main theorem. So I wanna say that this is the better version, which literally is kind of the, over any base version of crystalline cohomology. And recall again, if we worked over FP or over any perfect field, this relative THH is exactly equivalent to the absolute one. I mean, this has to do with, I mean, well, let me say a few words about that in a second, but here's the theorem about this relative THH. So first part states that 
Tp of this relative guy, cyclotomic k, is Wk linear. So it has a module structure over the width vectors of W of, of k. And if I take this guy and base change it over the width vectors down to k. So it's like taking the mod i reduction of my thing. Then this is just going to be a HP, periodic homology of C relative to K. So in other words, uh, this relative TP is a, is a lift of the RAM cohomology or two periodic the RAM cohomology to the bit vectors. That's what it is as a cohomology theory. And secondly, um, if there exists a lift C bar of C over the width vectors, right? In other words, if I have a DG category C bar, which is defined over the width vectors of K, such that if I base change it down to K, it gives me back K, uh, C, then I get that the topological periodic homology of the C cyclotomic relative to K is just equivalent to HP of that lift. So again, over this basic, over this basis, it basically has the defining property of crystalline cohomology. And finally, um, if X is smooth, smooth scheme over K, Um, then there exists a spectral sequence such the way that we had a spectral sequence before from two periodic periodic I mean the Ram Witt cohomology the Ram Witt cohomology so that's basically an invariant which was defined by Langer and Zink in the case of ZP algebras, P, I mean, localized at, the, at prime P, and I think in full generality by Chat Sistamazio. In full generality. And so my spectral sequence goes from two periodic the Ram Witt cohomology to TP of C, cyclotomic relative to K. <laughs> Okay, and that is my uh, justification why I consider this to be a two periodic version. And I mean, just for the experts, I think I'm basically out of time, right? I was supposed to go 50 minutes. Yeah, you can, you know, go a little bit longer if you need to, you know, to finish things up. You know, let's, let's... Well, I think I can pretty much like finish things up here. Let okay. me just like, I mean, say one, one last thing. There's this three prime, which is what, what we really prove is, and I mean, this uses something I haven't introduced yet. This is like the statement really is the generalization of a theorem of, of Hasselhoff Madsen, namely the C T T R star of, I mean, X. If I do the scheme X and I form this relative cyclotomic to K, sorry, I guess I should erase here. I form this TR of X cyclotomic relative to K. So TR is another invariant you can assign in the in the in the zoo of TPs and THHs, topological gadgets. And really what one can prove is that this is actually isomorphic to the the Ram Witt complex of X relative to WK. Okay, and this absolute, this is like the Durham bit complex, the relative Durham bit complex of Langer and Zink. And this theorem was for k equals fp or k equals a perfect ring of characteristic p proven by Hasselhoff and Madsen. And with this modified version of tr and thh, it's just true over any basis, no matter what. Okay, so that was my justification for arguing that this relative version of THH and TP are the right versions to consider. And I could have said it's related to the BMS filtration in certain bases, one the certain filtration set up by Bart Morrow and Scholze, but it's, it's really a non-commutative phenomenon. It makes sense for every non-commutative scheme and it does not use like resolutions of commutative rings. So it's totally different in nature. 
And right. So the only thing I guess I wanted to say, and I've skipped, is like I wanted to talk a little bit about some sort of vial cohomology style properties that this TP has. And yeah, let me just say it has some. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> I, I muted everyone so we can thank him. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and mute uh, people again to cut down on the background noise. And then we'll open it up for questions if there are any. Okay, if no questions, then we will wrap it up here for today. Um, we'll thank him uh, one more time. I'll unmute everyone. Thank you so much again. Okay, and the, the next meeting is in two weeks, and Nick Kuhn from University of Virginia will be speaking. Okay, thanks everyone.